the title of my message is Whether You Are in the Faith. Okay? Key verses, chapter 13, verse 5. Let's read the key verse together. Please examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Okay. Okay, remember what said to what God said to Apostle Paul, who was in great pain because of the thorn in the flesh, this of Satan. Torment him. God's grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul responded finally, when I am weak, then I am strong. He really learned to rely on the Lord. Now weakness may really learn to rely on the Lord. The Christ power may rest on us. These words be with us. After finishing his uh, defense, Paul said clearly what the purpose is for their strengthening. Your strengthening. Then from chapter 12, verse 19, running all the way to chapter 13, verse 10, the whole section is a sum summation of what concerns Paul. Paul concerns about <laughs> the spiritual well-being of his flock and the church. He gives such insight into issues that church must be concerned about to be built up as a wholesome one. In this chapter, last chapter, chapter 13, we see the words, warning, examine, test, four times written, indicates that examining whether we are in the faith or self-faith testing is crucial for our Christian life, for building up our Christian life and the church. First, repentance, discipline, authority. We know that we know that all these words are not pleasant and seem to be rejected in our society. But we should think of this. Paul talks about this. After ending this defense of his apostleship with the purpose of strengthening them, Paul says, For I fear, I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. You may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, faction, slander, passion, arrogance, and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you. And I will be grieved over many who have sinned, yet not have repented of impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery, in which they have indulged. What's first fear? It is sin problem remaining sin, especially the sin against the unity of the church and the purity of the church. Remaining sin would destroy the church at any time, at any moment. Unsolved sin problem must be resolved individually or church-wise. When you read Revelation, the reason Christ deals with sin in the churches. The church in Thyatira seems to be good with the commendation of Jesus. I know your days. I know your 
faith and love, your service and perseverance. You are doing now more than you did at first. But the reason Jesus reprimanded the church, saying, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of the food sacrificed to idols. The church compromised their holy life in Christ with the culture and idol worship. Jesus knew the seriousness of this problem and rebuked them, urging them to repentance. Jesus also said to the church in service, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Jesus wants its church to be alive in repentance. First John chapter 1 verse 7 says, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have a fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And one nine says, if you confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This promise promises we have. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin, and we have fellowship in the light. <coughs> Generally, now in our time, the general trend of the church is to embrace the culture and accept any kind of people, even with no hint of penitence, just having them comfortable with uh, no good feeling at all whatsoever. Most church seems to be swept by this uh, cultural power of uh, moral or uh, sexual revolution, deadened in sin. In deadened the church, they have no work of salvation of souls. Church can the church is the gathering of repentant sinners, while the world is the place of unrepentant sinners, even with no sense of shame over sin, even for the no awareness of sin. It is the world, but church should be different. Fundamentally, sin is violating or disobeying God's command. And we have to know that even if we do not sin, the sin of immorality, as the people of the world do, our stance must be clear. Where is stand? And sin is basically disobeying or violating God's law, God's command, God's word. Whenever we see that our sins are obvious, sin of disobedience and obedience is obvious, we need to repent. It is the process of being sanctified, growing in the holiness of God. <clears throat> this church may remain a repentant church, helping God's plan of worship to repent. Many of their sins are obvious based on the words of God. Lord, Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. It says, This is my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who have sinned or any of the, the others. 
These are related to church discipline. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between two of you. If he listens to you, you have won the brother over. If you not listen, take one or two the others along. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you refuse to listen to them, then take him to the church. If you refuse to listen to the church, even church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector, unbeliever. These are the words of Jesus. Church is not the community of people for their well-being. It is to be the place of soul's salvation, like Noah's ark, ark of salvation. That's why the church should be serious about sin. Sin grows and spreads like pandemic, more powerful than COVID-19, bringing each one to eternal destruction. One said, a church without church discipline is a church without Christ. And then Paul says here, on my return, I will not spare those who have sinned or any of the others. Peter said in chapter 1, verse 30, I call God my witness. It was in order to spare you that I did not visit to return to Corinth. He delayed. Why? He gave the time to repent. Unless they repented, he has to act toward unrepentant sinners as an apostle of Christ. In chapter 13, verse 10, he says, This is why I write these things when I'm absent. That when I come, I may not be, I may not have to be harsh. You serve my authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. So Paul was like a parent. We see in chapter 12, what I want is not your possession, but you. I will very glad, I'll be very glad, gladly spend everything I have for you. Even spend, expand my life as well. Paul did not want to be harsh by using the authority the Lord gave him, tearing him down, but he will not see that everything goes well and building them up. Transparent's heart. And here, it leads us to think about the authority the Lord gave to Paul. The authority the Lord gave him, different from human authority. He says here, since you are demanding proof that you are speaking, the Christ is speaking through me. And he says, he is not weak among you. He is not weak in dealing with you, but he is powerful among you. So first of all, Christ is among his people. For Jesus said in chapter 18, whether two or three gather in my name, there am I be with there am I with them. What a promise. We have good habit of gathering in the name of Jesus. Two or three gather, there I be with them. Also, in Revelation, Jesus was walking among the lamp stands, which are churches. With the big or small, Jesus is walking among the people in the church. Even now, we believe. He is vigilant, watching over them, commanding and rebuking. He protects, also fights with them when they go wrong. He is not indifferent at all. He is watchful and powerful among them, among his people. His presence is invisible, but evident. 
He builds up, showing his transforming power. Or he can remove the church. Builds up, he can remove. And then he calls it, for to be sure, that Jesus was crucified in his weakness. Yet, he lives by God's power. Jesus was, yes, helplessly crucified by the hands of Romans and inflicted by the Jews. His death on the cross was a pitiful and tragic event in the eyes of people of the world until now. However, his crucifixion shows, yes, his helplessness and his power, his weakness and his might. For the crucifixion of Jesus have saving power. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified, power of God, wisdom of God. And the power of Christ's crucifixion is, was vindicated by the power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. This is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1. That power is like working of his mighty strength, which he exalted in Christ when raised him from the dead. Christ lives by past power. He always lives. Amen. He lives by God's power, or he lives. Yes. We are weak, but he lives by God's power. He wants us to dwell in him. And then your Paul says, Likewise, we are weak in him, but by God's power, we live with him to serve him. He had said in chapter 10, verse 1, by the weakness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. He served with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now he will serve by God's power. And his power and authority comes from the power of God when he lived with Christ. Delivering the message, hearing, speaking the words of God. How powerful and authoritative the words of God are. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Has crossed over from death to life. Wow. Hearing his words. Moved from death to life. He also said in chapter 12, but for the one who hears my words and does not keep them, the very word I spoke will condemn him the last day. Yes. His words are powerful and authoritative. Words of God have to be revealed as they are when he believe and proclaim. Mm -hmm. The authority we ever have and also the authority of the scriptures must stand in the church and the authority of the words of God must be standard in the church, however the world changes. The authority that we ever have, the authority, very authority that we can ever exercise is a biblical authority. Then how powerful and authoritative the words of God are. Whoever believes will be condemned. Whoever believes will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Whoever believe or not believing. Yes, there is heaven and hell. There is new Jerusalem and fire lake upon itself. Repent or perish. Last week, I met one student from India, his third year. He said his religion is the Hindu. I, what do you believe about 
how will you came into being? He said, this chemical response, two energies were combined and I came into being. When it dissolved, I began. So then I asked, what's the meaning of life? He thought for a while. And I said about God's creation. God created you. And Christ's death and resurrection. He died for your sins. He rose again from the dead. In Jesus, there is forgiveness of sin and victory of death. There is eternal life. He'll come again. He lasted over 30 minutes. At the end, he was so thankful. He was very interested. Seems very interested in it. As we believe and speak, God may all I pray for him. So my direction is at least one person, to one person I may share the gospel. As we believe and speak, the authority we have is biblical authority, <clears throat> believing and speak. This authority is above government authority, above any institution's authority, above authority of the world. Biblical authority we have, believe and speak. Second, examine yourselves. Now, process, let's read this verse together. Abby, can you read that read together, please? Yeah. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Abby, do you understand the meaning, the name, the word examine and test? Oh, you, in your homeschooling, there is test? Oh, there is test. Wow. Examine, examination, test. Did you pass? <laughs> in our society, there are many kinds of examinations and tests. For school, there are midterm exam, and final exam. There is also a physical examination for traveling, for insurance, you need physical examination. Yes, this is to prevent our body from diseases. But here, Paul says about examination of the faith. No faith definitely is related to our spiritual life, to eternity. Hmm? Examination of the faith. People can say, there seems to be various kinds of faith. We have your faith. I have my faith. I believe in myself. This is also faith. You know, demons have faith, saying there is one God on his head. Demonic faith. Hmm? And Paul said of one Lord, one faith. All the believers of the world, true believers, have one faith, one Lord. And Judah said in verse 3, I felt to write and urge you to contend for the faith that is once for all interested to all the saints. All the saints throughout history have the same faith. One faith, same faith, common faith, as Paul said, Titus, Titus, my true son, you know, common faith. Paul was a Jew, Titus was a Greek, but common faith. Hmm? And he says, verse 1 and 2, for a servant of Christ, a servant of God, and a possible Christ Jesus. For the faith of God's elect and knowledge of the truth, which is the gatheringness of faith and knowledge that rest, resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of the time. Faith is related to hope of eternal life. And we remember what Jesus said in chapter 7 of John's Gospel, his prayer to God. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom we have sent. So, it's crystal clear that the faith Paul talks about is faith in Jesus Christ, which saves sinners, saving faith. You know, there's only one faith, the saving faith through Jesus Christ. Acts 12 says, salvation is found, salvation is found in no one else, but there's no other name. On the heaven given to man, by which he must be saved. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 and 23 says, The righteousness 
from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no difference. Out of sin, then for short of the glory of God. Only through faith in Jesus Christ, sinners can be made righteous, justified, and saved. How precious the faith in Jesus Christ is. Abi, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Amen. Yes, the little children are old people. There's no difference. One makes difference is only faith in Jesus Christ. You know, Paul said in Roman in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. This is from God, not from the wealth of the world, from the power of the world, from the success of the world. No, it's from God, gift of God. Yes, freely given through faith in Jesus Christ. Yet, we have to keep this faith that is costly. We have to keep this faith at any circumstances. As for all the Christians, they denied Caesar worship and procedure worship, not to deny their faith in Jesus Christ. There are those who are gloriously willing martyred to keep their faith in the one who died for them and rose again from the dead. Paul seems to be, Paul, yeah, Paul did many great things in his life. Many great things. But at the end of his life, his confession was th is this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We know, we heard that in communist countries, like North Korea, keeping their faith is so difficult. In our country, seemingly, democratic countries seem to be easy, but not. There is no direct threat, but indirect threat, which is growing more and more. That's the trend of the world, keeping one's faith. Mm -hmm. Great challenge. But Jesus said, when talk about the signs of the end of the age, you stand from to the end will be saved. You stand from to the end will be saved. By standing form, you will gain life. For this, for this process, examine your service to see whether you are in the faith. Test your service. There is a saying, prevention is better than cure. Yes, this is prevention from spiritual disease and eternal destruction. So Paul tells the Quintan believers to examine their themselves whether they are in the faith. Have faith testing, self checkup, self test, so that they may be in a spiritually safe zone, sound in faith. And Paul was very painful. There are those who abandoned their faith. In 1 Timothy, he said, we might win fight a good fight, holding on faith and good conscience. Some have rejected this and so have shipwrecked their faith. Names are here. Among them are Emmanuel and Alexander. So painful have to see such people. So he urged them to have a face test, examine to see whether in the faith. So he said to his son, spiritual son Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely, both how you, what you believe, how you live. As for us, we really examine ourselves whether Jesus is the Lord in our lives, especially when he make an important to 
decision in life. And also, our attitude toward materials. We are living in a money oriented society, the society where money rules. And what is our attitude toward materials? Let's be clear. Jesus said, where your treasure is, where your heart also will be. Also, we should examine whether we worship God with God's people absolutely, joyfully, and thankfully. And how we start each day, I want us to, he wants us to have time with him. That our fellowship with him is alive through his word and prayer. And remember, God tested Abraham, commanding him of Isaac, stay, to see whether he loves Isaac more than God. God really wanted Abraham to love God more than anything else and be free. What do you love more than God becomes an idol that ensnares our souls, both are ruined. And we started the first John. It what this is about God's love. God's love, God's love, two times says, and this epistle ends with his words, your children, keep yourselves from idols. And Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing, the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. Last week, one thought came into my mind. Why do people, why does God put people in my life like pet? We meet the people in our pets of life. Actually, not many people. Limited people. And they say, meeting people is blessing. And Toronto means meeting place, good name. And there are various kinds of meetings. Meeting between husband and wife, parents and children, friends, Bible students and Bible teachers. Why? Why does God put people in my life? Questioning this. I like to repent of the cover, showing God's love. Some people passed it to my mind, my mind. I repent of the cover, showing God's love. That's God's mercy. Yes, the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself, love. Also, one important cover is to me, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Rely on Jesus' shed blood, cling to the cross of Jesus. Live by the Spirit. Christian life is. May God help us, mercy on me, to be awakened of my complacence each moment. Live by the Spirit. And I see that if crying out prayer is alive in each morning's prayer, then sound. If not, then check up. You can have a checklist. Yes, whether you are in the faith. And then here, one thing, after the Paul says, after saying, test yourselves. And then he says, don't you realize, do you not realize the crisis in you? Unless you, of course, have failed the test. This seems to be an obvious question. Yes, we are Christians, Christians. Christ lives in them. But this is a sarcastic expression and poignant question. Paul says in Romans 8, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Christians are those in whom Christ is. But Paul had a serious question about Corinthian believers because they seem to accept another Jesus, another gospel, Another spirit. So Paul wanted to make sure that Christ is in them. Then they will not stand, they will not stand with the false teachers who masquerade themselves as a person of light, a person of Christ. And John says in 1 John chapter 4, dear 
friends. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits they are from God, because false teachers have gone out of the, into the world. And he says, dear children, you are from God. You have overcome them. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. They speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We need to recognize the spirit of truth and spirit of falsehood. That we may, faith may be true and genuine. And then the following verse is, he hits prayers that you will not do anything wrong. You will do what is right. Even if we may seem to have faith. If some thought, if he did what is right, Paul is recognized. He can be proved by people. No, genuine concern. Apart from that, do what is right. In the faith, in Christ, in them. And his prayer. And then he says, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. He was an apostle of Christ, apostle of truth. He said, chapter 4, setting forth the truth plainly. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And chapter 6, we commend ourselves in purity and in the word of truth. According to Jesus' words, Jesus is the truth. And he came to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listened to him. <laughs> His prayer is that for their perfection is fully restored in our translation, made complete, mature, and doesn't want to be harsh. Ending seems to be tough, but out of his perfection, not harsh. And then this is final greeting. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Goodbye is kind of a sad word, people think. So they will not say goodbye, but see you, Cain said. But goodbye actually means, I hope things are good, go well. But actually, in Greek, it's Cain, Kario, rejoice, for the greeting, rejoice. And clear, and then aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind, even peace. God of love and peace will be with you. And Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings. And then, benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be the all. This is really striking. Wow. At the end, Paul's heart is full of blessing. This comprehensive blessing. To whom? To Corinthian believers who gave much time, hard time, much pain to him. I think among all the churches, Paul established, Christian church is the worst church. But full of blessing. You cannot find this benediction here. Full mm. blessing, I believe, reflects of God's heart. Thank God for his words. Examine yourselves whether you are in the faith to see and test yourselves. Our faith is based in Jesus Christ and authority of the words of God. Every authority we have, our faith be true and genuine, reflected in our lives and the church, their faith, they overcome ourselves, the cultural trend of our society and this world. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this uh, study, last chapter of uh, Second Corinthians. Examine yourselves whether in the faith, test yourselves. How important discrimination is, this test is related to our eternal testing, whether in the faith, faith in Jesus Christ, authority of the words of God, Father, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, salvation has come. Their faith in Jesus, who died for our sins and rose again from the dead, is the gift of God, not from this world, power of this world, success of this world, wealth of this world, anything from God, 
how precious gift it is. But uh, remember us, mercy on us to keep this faith at any cost. Father, this examination of the faith build us to our fellowship with you, your life each day, to the end of our lives. However, the world changes, may grow strong, pure and genuine, young and old, each one personally lead us. Thank you for your words. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>